Now on BBC Two, John Peel revisits the world of a comic genius, a rebel without a clue. <laughs> In the late 1950s, television's most popular address was 23 Railway Cuttings East Cheam, an amusing location in those distant days before Cheam became the byword for sophisticated and gracious living that it is, of course, today. Then number 23 was the home of the star of the BBC's top comedy series, Hancock's Half Hour, the abundantly named Anthony Aloysius St. John Hancock. This was the character, famous for his vanity, his pomposity and his horrible feet, that had been invented with huge success for BBC Radio by Tony Hancock and his writers Ray Galton and Alan Simpson. They moved to television in 1956, and up until 1961 they were responsible for seven series which set standards of funniness for TV comedy, which most of Hancock's successors have struggled to match to this day. Until the final BBC series in 1961, Hancock's steadfast comedy partner and long-suffering co-resident at Railway Cuttings was the prune-faced carry-on star, Sid James. Hancock and Galton and Simpson's comedy can still seem as fresh as a spring morning today, but our memories of what Britain was like in the late 1950s, before it got to swing its way groovily through the 1960s, are a lot more foggy. <laughs> In Hancock's Half Hour, the satire-edged scripts combined with Hancock's performing genius to capture the uncertainty of the era, when the nation was wavering between the end of a decade of post-war austerity and the start of the 1960s, between the old world of the empire, fair play and the stiff upper lip, and the new one of consumerism, rock and roll, and the decadent Dolce Vita. Hancock, like myself, probably thought Dolce Vita was a kind of ice cream. He was a true Brit of the old school and liked people to know it. <laughs> It's cure for everything. In fact, it's far worse now than it was during the war. When Harold Super Mac Macmillan became the new Conservative Prime Minister in 1957, it was only three years after the end of rationing. The wages of victory since 1945 had turned out to be light on life's essentials like butter, bacon and fashionable trousers. It wasn't surprising that memories of the war were hard to shake off. Of course, for real war heroes, their exploits were death-defying feats they didn't like to talk about, old boy. Hancock's tales just defied belief. Like Macmillan said, they'd never had it so good as in the late 1950s. Never, never had it so good, in fact, since most of the shiny new consumer goods were bought on higher purchase. Still, there was a glamorous young Queen Elizabeth on the throne and progress and excitement everywhere. And if you wanted to get away from all that, there were sleek new airliners to take more people on affordable foreign holidays. It was the dawn of a new Britain in Italian-style coffee bars and American-style self-service shops, restaurants and laundrettes. There was even a new action-packed commercial television station to watch, if you could adjust your aerial just so. I hope so. But what did sex matter when you could go to bed with a good book? In the 1950s, the pursuit of knowledge was more important and more widely available in colleges, night schools and libraries than ever before. It was time to think of higher things. It was a fine time to be a new go-go tycoon, but hard-up members of the aristocracy were having to open their stately homes to the public. Tourism was another booming industry. There was easy money to be had from the National Trust, provided you could lay your hands on a bit of our glorious national heritage to sell. Hancock was truly the man of his times. The BBC's lad in the Astrakhan collar coat never really did get to see if he too could swing along a 60s. Hancock left both his on-screen character and Galton and Simpson behind when he quit the BBC in 1961, seven years before his tragic early death.
And the very best of Hancock's Half Hour is now available from BBC Video and BBC Radio Collection.